Well, my long-awaited return has been made. I definitely did not record, uh, 10.1 thinking that I was done with episode 9 beforehand. No, most certainly not. So, buckle your fuckles, get prepared. You already know every overdone joke I'm about to make. If you're new here, there's a uh, link to the first episode in the up there part. There is about that much more true crime content that you could watch, so if you like true crime, that would probably be in your best interest. And without further ado, let's just dive right into it. 1924 Canadian Pacific Railway bombing. Keeping with the theme of last episode, which is that no plane, train, or automobile is safe up in this bitch, let's talk about another train that went kablooey. There isn't really a relevant Wikipedia article on this, mostly because they all focus on the religious figure who was killed in this bombing, one Mr. Peter Verrigan. So I'm here on this obscure early 2000s Canadian history website. But hey, at least it's divided into chunks that make sense. Now, known by the single name Lordly, Mr. Peter Verrigan was revered as a semi-deity, a demigod, if you will, by Dokobors. Peter Vasilievich Verrigan inspired his Dokobor followers to build a communal empire that spread over three western provinces in the years after 1899 when they arrived in Canada. But in the early morning of October 29th, 1924, an explosion on the remote Kettle Valley Line in southeastern British Columbia ripped apart the Canadian Pacific Railroad car. 1586, killing 65-year-old Lordly, his 17-year-old female companion, because that isn't a major red flag at all, and seven others. Not everyone mourned his death. I wouldn't mourn the death of a 65-year-old man fucking a 17-year-old, but I digress. Some Western Canadians were jealous of the success of the communal Dacobors, while others resented their attachment to their culture and language. Could fanatic nativists have killed him? Or was it as many felt within the Dacobor community the work of the Canadian or Russian governments, as each was thought to want to be rid of Verrigan? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and posit a theory here, which is, you're not that guy, pal. You're not that guy. While loved by most of his faith, even some Dokobors resented Lordly's heavy hand and had deserted the commune. Others believed that Lordly's accommodation to government laws was treason to go to Dokobor principles. Some, living under very harsh circumstances, resented his exalted status. Uh, here's more dramatization for the sake of writing where they ask, was it his own people? I don't fucking know. Maybe the train just exploded. And that's what the next little chunk of words here is. Could it have been a tragic accident? An explosion of gas used to light the rail car or dynamite car? Callously transported by prospectors. Uh, no one has ever been charged in the case, though, and the case remains open. What shattered Verrigan's and the others at Snowy Night is remained locked in the lonely Monashi Mountains where they died. But with the benefit of access to archives, a reconstruction of the death scene, and a modern forensic report, perhaps you can solve this mystery by reading this website no one else has visited since 2009. There's some context that doesn't provide any context. There's the explosion itself, which reports of the carnage caused by an explosion in car 1586 on the Kettle Valley Line brought immediate action from the police, government, and the Canadian Pacific Railway. But the location of the blast posed a problem. It was near Ferron, a minor station deep in the Monastery Mountains that was used mainly for crew and equipment changes. There were no low roads to the site, so the Cobors police, CPR officials, and Canadian government explosive experts rushed to the scene by rail on special trains or using small handcars. Press accounts relied upon interviews with witnesses, including injured people, some of whom were taken to Grand Forks, and others eased to Nelson. At Grand Forks, a coroner's inquest was hastily assembled on the evening of October 29th, just 19 hours after the explosion. There, the deaths of Peter Verrigan, John McKee, Hakum Sain, and Peter J. Campbell were investigated. At Nelson, an inquest into the deaths of Harry Bishop, Neil Murray, and Mary Streleif began on uh, November 1st and continued to November 5th. Two of the explosion's victims did not die immediately, so their deaths were not subject of an inquest. These inquests and reports of the police who attended at the scene and participated in the inquests constitute the main body of evidence about what happened. 
and uh, they talk more about what you'll find in this section. Onward into the next little paragraph. The suspects. The goal of every proper criminal investigation is to, uh, you know, figure out whether or not it was actually a criminal matter, and then figure out who the fuck was guilty. They failed at this. First, reports about the disaster on the Kettle Valley line near Ferrone pointed to so an accident being the cause of the explosion that killed the nine people in car 1586. And there are people who know the case well today who believe this to be the correct explanation, but we're a bunch of argumentative shitheads, so why would us apes ever agree on that? Others at the time and since have argued that the explosion was a result of a calculated scheme since some, you know, uh, B-list cult leader who is completely unremembered by history was important enough to fucking blow up at the time, who knows? Peter Verrigan was supposedly by far the most prominent individual amongst those who died, and most attention is turned to those who might have wanted him dead and why. There were many possible candidates because Verrigan's high-handedness and power made enemies. But no less important, he was the highly visible head of a social, cultural, and economic movement that some people distrusted and even hated. Especially because in like the 1950s, America would go, Wee, The possible conspirators against him ranged from fellow Decobors immediately at hand to broader political and personal competitors half a world away. In this section, we see the most important documents. Okay, I don't need to read this bit. We also have a little bit on the aftermath. After Peter Lordly Verrigan's death, the Question community of Universal Brotherhood faced a challenging future. Just one challenge was financial pressures from the company that had loaned the commune money and from the BC government. The province also continued to prosecute Dokobor parents for failing to send their children to school. And that escalated in 1925 into public confrontation and aggressive police action that uh, would be read about in the following documents if, you know, I bothered to read them. There's also some interpretations. Everything on this website is a primary document. This feels like it was made for a school project. Holy fucking shit, it was. Teachers can request access to the experts' interpretations of the mysteries. Holy fucking shit, I've been reading some kid's homework. What the fuck? Anyways, uh, they never found who, who did it. It was 50-50 toss-up on whether someone actually decided to kill the communist supposed demigod, or uh, whether or not it was just, uh, you know, Bad luck. Probably bad luck. Occam's razor. The most simple explanation is probably the correct one. Canadian Pacific Airlines Flight 21, because fuck Canada in particular. Canadian Pacific Airlines Flight 21 was a scheduled domestic flight from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada to Whitehorse, Yukon, Canada, via Prince George, Saint Fort St. John, Fort Nelson, and Watson Lake on July 8, 1965. The Douglas DC 6B plane crashed near the 100 mile house, British Columbia, taking the lives of all 52 aboard, and an inquest determined that the explosion was definitely the result of a bomb, but as of 2021, the crime remains unsolved. While en route from Vancouver to Prince George, a DC-6 Empress of City of Buenos Aires, piloted by World War II veteran John Jack Steele, crashed after passing Ashcroft, British Columbia at about 1540. 340 for those of us who don't use military time. Three Mayday calls were heard by air traffic control in Vancouver, and an explosion had occurred in the left aft lavatory. The tail separated from the fuselage, the aircraft spiraled and crashed into a wooden area. And of course, all 46 passengers and six crew perished. The crash site is 40 kilometers, 21, 25 miles, west of 100 Mile House. Remnants of the DC-6 remain at the crash site near Dog Creek. A coroner's inquest concluded an explosive substance foreign to the normal contents of the aircraft caused a crash. No fucking shit. A witness on the ground saw the tail of the aircraft separate from the fuselage and debris trail out from behind the aircraft. The debris turned out to be bodies. These bodies were forced out by the depressurization of the aircraft. The fuselage was consumed by fire where it fell, but the tail, found 500 meters away, was not. Rescue crews reached the crash site while the fire continued to burn, but no survivors were found. No fucking shit. Crash investigators found traces of an acid that led them to believe a bomb in the lavatory was involved. Traces of potassium nitrate and carbon consistent with a low-velocity explosion were found. Gunpowder or stumping powder causes low-velocity explosions. The explosion damaged bulkheads in the lavatory, severed pipes in the tail, and tore a meter-wide hole in the side of the fuselage. 
The Royal Canadian Mounted Police investigation focused on four passengers, although none were suspects. No one claimed responsibility and no charges were ever laid. The source of the explosion, who put the bomb there, remains unknown. The crash was re-examined, but surprise, surprise, nobody fucking found anything! The Toledo Clubber Thanks to user mh underscore 12rm underscore 66 from five years ago for writing this r slash unresolved mysteries post that I will now be so beautifully reading to you. In the fall of 1925, the city of Toledo, Ohio was terrorized for but two weeks by a crazed madman. At the end of the attacks, 12 women had been victimized. Five had died from the attacks, and the remainder were left severely wounded. Using a heavy object, such as a bat or a club, the killer would hit his victims from behind and then continue to smash their faces in until they were dead, or seemed to be. The first victim, Miss Frank Hall, was severely beaten on November 10th while sitting in front of her house, but survived the attack. The next two victims, Emma Hatfield and Lydia Baumgartner, that's such a weirdly common last name, attacked on separate days, were both attacked from behind while walking down dark streets. Both of these two victims survived initially, but later died of, oh, you know, severe trauma. They were able to give police a description of their attacker, but nothing came of it. You've got to think, this is 1925. Now, of course, the next week, someone was attacked at least once a day, throwing the city into a panic. Two more people died on this week, including a young schoolteacher named Lily Croy and a middle-aged housewife, who remains unnamed. Another victim was Mary Handley, who was found bludgeoned to death outside of her home. Over a thousand men were put onto the streets by the American Legion in order to deter attacks and to apprehend a suspect should he strike again. Women were also cautioned not to walk alone at night, and were accompanied by men when they did in an attempt to discourage a killer. Since this was a high-profile case, hundreds of tips were fielded to the police, but they were unable to attain any solid leads on the clubber's identity. The description they put out didn't help much either. Police described him as having superhuman strength, fiery eyes, and a beast-like appearance, despite the fact that he was almost certainly an average-looking man. The killing ceased after the two-week spree, and the case went cold. Despite the fact the killer was never caught, there have been some theories on his identity. A man named Stanley Hopp, who was awaiting execution in 1928 for the abduction and murder of seven-year-old Dorothy Silogowski, confessed to being the curler of one of the clever's victims, schoolteacher Lily Croy. Hop was a taxi driver who was on trial for beating Dorothy to death during a bootleg whiskey-fueled crime spree. Shortly after his confession, Stanley was found guilty of Dorothy's murder, not Lily's, and then executed. There are no articles that discuss him or his connection to the clubber, so there's no evidence aside from his word that he's the killer. Another man, James Coiner, serving a sentence in Michigan City, Indiana, my bad, Indiana Prison for Grave Robbery was questioned and investigated by Chicago Police in connection to the Toledo cover, as well as based on evidence of letters he had smuggled out of his prison to his sister in Chicago. In his letters to his sister, Coiner mentioned a trunk that may have had objects stolen from the grave robberies, and also mentioned that there was other evidence in the trunk that, if discovered, would make him through forever. Some of the bodies of the women were clubbed to death, were reportedly found without skulls, and authorities were on the lookout for these skulls as evidence. The Chicago police became tipped off and notified the Toledo police when Coiner made statements that he was in the Toledo area when six of the attacks took place. This further inflamed the press because Coiner was a large black man, which, of course, made people at the time believe he possessed superhuman strength. However, in a surprising twist, it turned out James Coiner was an Elias, and that his real name was actually Alonzo Robinson. Robinson was a career criminal and killer who had a history of terrorizing women. Although there is virtually no information on him, one website did tell his story, albeit it's unknown how much of that is true, because how the fuck are we supposed to verify it? The alleged story of Robinson is as follows. 
Born to poverty in Cleveland, Mississippi, Robinson was arrested by hometown authorities in 1918 on charges of mailing obscene letters to local women. He escaped from custody on route to jail and made his getaway despite a bullet being put into his shoulder. Eight years later, when decapitated women's bodies started turning up around Michigan City, police suspected Robinson's alias James Coiner of the multiple murders. Four severed heads were found at a house he once occupied in Ferndale, Michigan, but Robinson had moved on by that time, convicted and sentenced to prison for grave robbing in Indiana. Interrogated by Michigan authorities in jail, Robinson played dumb, and the existing evidence proved insufficient to support a murder charge. Paroled in July 1934, Robinson as Coiner returned to Cleveland, Mississippi, and picked up his old hobby of writing obscene letters. One was mailed to an Indianapolis woman, the incorrect address identical to a recent misprint on an Indianapolis paper. Postal inspectors were still scouring the paper subscriptions list when Robinson claimed two more victims close to home. On December 8, 1934, Aurelius Turner and his wife were shot to death in Cleveland. The woman's body mutilated with chunks of flesh sliced off and carried away by the killer. A month later, federal authorities traced poison pen artist James Coiner to a post office box in Shaw, Mississippi and officers were waiting for him when he came to get his mail on January 12, 1935. Robinson went for his 38, but, you know, the deputies got to their big iron on their hips much faster, and he surrounded in the face of superior firepower. The search of his pockets and lodgings revealed more obscene letters, a packet of human hair in Turner's color, strips of human flesh, salted and cured like beef jerky. In custody, Robinson freely confessed to the murders, he also admitted to ownership of the heads found in Michigan, but claimed they were trophies secured during various grave robbing expeditions. The prisoner offered no motive for his actions, but as a local newspaper proclaimed, Robinson admitted that he was a sex pervert, which he's considered to be the underlying cause for the crime. Due to Robinson's violent tendencies and that he was allegedly in Toledo during the attacks, he appears to be the only prime suspect during this case. Now, the Redditor who once posted this wants to know what everyone else thinks. I think that it looks a little bit suspicious, but this happened in 1925, so we have no fucking way of knowing, do we? The River Park Rapist. Now, in an interesting monkey wrench that is new to uh, me having it thrown at my head at least, uh, I can't actually find the details of the case. As a matter of fact, all I can find is uh, Richard Alexander, who was arrested as the River Park Rapist, and then cleared. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Google, for providing me very relevant search results. I really appreciate that fantastic job. So I guess I'd better go on to the next entry. Bird Road Rapist. Well, if you look at that cute little face right there, that deserves to be fucking sent to the Shadow Realm personally. Look at that! It's the asshole who supposedly committed it, and also the thumbnail to the last video. Fun fact about all of these videos, there's a picture on the side that is, you know, relevant to at least one of the cases discussed in the iceberg entry. But anyways, let's get into the case details. On July 19th, 1977, in Coral Gables, Florida, a 17-year-old girl named Judy was driving home along Bird Road when a car came up behind her and began flashing its lights. The car then pulled up next to her and the driver pulled out a gun. He forced Judy out of her car, where he drove her to a construction site and then raped her. The rapist then drove five blocks away and dropped Judy off. He kept her driver's license and panties. Judy had become the first victim of a man called the Bird Road Rapist, who kidnapped and raped 24 women between 1977 and 1979. Judy described her assailant as someone between 6'0 and 6'2, weighing about 220 pounds, and he spoke English with a slight Spanish accent. He also said he had a mustache and drove a light green car. Two days after the attack, Judy was at her job at a gas station when she thought she saw someone in the same car in which she had been raped. Judy and a co-worker went out to the car and she wrote down the man's license plate number. After the man left, Judy called the police and told them about her sighting. Investigators would then 
go on to speak with the car's owner, one Mr. Luis Diaz, who worked as a cook at a Cuban restaurant. Diaz was working at the time when the investigators tried to speak to him. However, he did not speak English, so they were unable to question him. Authorities doubted that he was a rapist since he did not speak English and did not fit the description that Judy had given him. He was only 5'3 and 120 pounds, and he was soon dismissed as a subject. Meanwhile, the rapes continued at a rate of one attack per month. The MO was the same each time. The victims were always young women driving alone. The rapist always flashed his lights at them, and the women assumed that he was either a police officer or a motorist in distress or someone trying to warn them about a car problem. However, each time they got out of the car, they were abducted by the rapist. At first, authorities assumed that the Bird Road rapist was one man, but the descriptions given by the victims differed. Some described him as white, others as Hispanic. Some claimed he was short, while others claimed he was tall. Some said that he spoke English with a Spanish accent, while others claimed he had no accident at all, and apparently he drove several different cars. Publicity about the case increased the pressure on the police. The first victim, Judy, eventually told police they should try to question the man she identified as her attacker, Diaz, again. Diaz says that when he was brought in for questioning, the investigators continued to talk to him in English, even though he had no fucking clue what they were saying. Diaz cooperated with the investigators once they were able to get an interpreter, however. Then, authorities decided to show another victim a photo lineup which included a picture of Diaz. The victim, who had been attacked just two months earlier, identified Diaz as her assailant. On 2 a.m. on August 29, 1979, Diaz was arrested in his home. And on the night Diaz was arrested, police launched a massive effort to build a strong case against him. They impounded Diaz's car in an attempt to find some sort of physical evidence that would connect him to the rapes, but uh, they found nothing. They tore apart his home, searching for the gun they used in the attacks along with the panties and driver's license of the victims. Once again, they found nothing. Sixteen victims were brought in to look at Diaz in a police lineup, and eight identified him as a rapist. As a result, he was charged with those eight attacks in spite of there being no fucking evidence. Now, of course, after Diaz was charged with these attacks, conveniently, the search for the Bird Road rapist officially stopped, but a key point in proving the case against Diaz was showing that he was in fact bilingual. Investigators interviewed several of Diaz's former neighbors, and neighbors wrote in their report that he does speak English. They also learned that Diaz had a brother who was a used car salesman, which he had easy access to several new cars. Virginia Snyder, a private investigator, was hired by Diaz's attorneys to attempt to find evidence to clear Diaz. Based on the variety of descriptions, Snyder felt certain that there was more than one rapist involved in the case, and that it was not Diaz. Very convenient to say, yeah, there's more than one, but it's not the guy who's paying me. On April 29, 1980, Diaz's trial began, and the strongest evidence against him was the testimony of the eight victims who identified him as a rapist. Roy Black, Diaz's defense attorney, pointed out that despite an intensive investigation, police never found any physical evidence that could connect him to the rapes. Many of the victims stated their attackers spoke English. This was something that was difficult for Black to discredit. However, he was able to find several witnesses who said that Diaz, while working for a lawn care business, one is unable to speak English to them and that they needed to get an interpreter to get help. Black notes that if Diaz could have spoken English, he would have in this instance since he's trying to get business from the customers. The prosecutor, however, claimed that Diaz spoke enough English to be the rapist, because that definitely makes sense. Can't speak English to make money, but you can speak English to rape women. Two detectives testified that after they arrested Diaz, he spoke to them in English for 90 minutes. However, let's consider the fact that this is cops. Cops are crooked, and I don't trust that for a fucking second. However, none of this was tape recorded, which means we can't trust this for a fucking second. Suck my dick, detectives. Now, Black, of course, believes that the conversation never occurred, and you can't prove that it does. Throughout the trial, an interpreter spoke to Diaz, telling him everything that was happening. Black felt that if Diaz actually spoke English, he would have blurted out something in the English accidentally at some point in the trial, but this never happened. Diaz's defense also noted that he had almost no time to actually commit the rapes. He almost never drove alone. His wife 
dr always dropped him off at work and picked him up when he was done snyder also discovered that the detectives were incorrect about diaz's brother-in-law she found that the brother-in-law was not a used car salesman but actually an insurance salesman which means that diaz had easy access to a piece of fucking shit asshole who sells a scumbag business not several used cars Another point made by the defense was that since Diaz worked as a cook in a restaurant, he always cover was covered in the smell of fat, grease, and especially garlic, but none of the victims ever reported smelling anything on their attacker. Diaz definitely would have not have had enough time to go home and get a shower before committing the rapes, so it would be expected that his smell would have remained on him. The defense called in one of Diaz's co-workers to testify about the garlic smell and how it never goes away. You know, great defense here, but that must be pretty fucking sad. Hey boss, can you talk about how smelly this piece of shit is? The prosecution, however, pointed out that the smell was not at all noticeable in the courtroom, which meant that it would make sense that the victims could not smell it either, which is a bad faith and bullshit argument, because uh, sex is pretty up close and personal, and rape is pretty up close and personal. I can definitely smell the person I'm having sex with when I'm having sex with them. Despite many arguments made by the defense, the eyewitness statements seem to have been more of an effect on the jury. Black, however, notes that eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable because that pink sack of shit in your head you call a brain lies to you all the time in a desperate attempt to make sense of whatever the fuck this is. He says that one victim said that her attacker was 6'2". Diaz is 5'3". I hope you see the problem with that. Now, of course, the prosecutor claims that the other discrepancies are um, unimportant, but what is important was that all eight of them identified Diaz as a rapist. But again, one victim said her attacker was 6'2", Diaz is 5'3". But of course, when the case went to the jury, they acquitted Diaz of one of the rapes. However, they convicted him of four other rapes, along with four kidnappings, three aggravated assaults, two robberies, one attempted kidnapping, one burglary, one assault, one battery, and one count of using a firearm while committing a felony. Diaz was sentenced to 13 life terms plus 55 years. After Diaz's conviction, everything seemed to return to normal, but doubts soon emerged. Virginia Snyder noted that the judge for the trial originally believed that Diaz was guilty, but became uncertain after he read her report on the case. At the judge's request, Snyder began reinvestigating the case. She questioned the witnesses who were previously questioned by detectives. She found several discrepancies between what they had told her and what was in the detectives' reports. One detective said that a neighbor had heard Diaz speaking in English, and when the neighbor was questioned, he said the detective was mistaken. The detective was later arrested for falsifying police reports, although the reports were not related to Diaz's case, but, you know, I don't know, if I'm going to commit credit card fraud through one credit card company, I'm probably going to do it through other credit card companies. Jesus fucking Christ, American law system, what the fuck is wrong with you? Snyder has now come to believe that there are multiple men responsible for the Bird Road rapes, and that Diaz was not one of them. She believes that a specific gang was actually responsible. She questioned one of the gang members in prison. The specific member claimed that he was not involved in the rapes, but knew several men who did. The man gave Snyder an eight-page affidavit swearing that Diaz was innocent. When another victim, named Debbie, came forward, claiming she did not believe Diaz was a Bird Road rapist, Debbie had been approached by the rapist, or a rapist, on the 20th of December, 1978. She was able to escape the man without being raped, and Debbie described this piece of shit as 6-0, clean-shaven, with dark blonde hair. This description is the opposite of Diaz. Although Debbie identified Diaz at trial, she said that she was not sure of her identification. No one was. When she was shown Diaz in a police lineup, she recognized him for news reports and assumed that the police had the right man, so she identified him. No, the police never have the right guy. Jesus fucking Christ. Before the trial, Debbie and other testifying victims were called into a prosecutor's office. Each of them told their stories, and she felt that it was actually a rehearsal to determine which of the victims should go on stand at trial. Then, on the day Debbie was scheduled to testify, she was speaking to another victim about testifying. The other victim said she couldn't remember Diaz's face, and she actually needed the bailiff to point him out prior to court proceedings. The victim then spoke to Debbie. She said that she was not certain that her attacker was Diaz. No one was! 
but she also said that she would just identify him as the attacker anyway, which is stupid as fuck. That's genuinely stupid. Are you new? Are you dense? Are you lacking in brain cells? Debbie once again felt she was making a mistake when identifying Diaz. No fucking shit, Debbie. Then, after Diaz was convicted, Debbie claims she was approached by another man who attempted to attack her in the same way as a bird road rapist tried to attack her years prior. Another victim from the trial, Mary, says she believes Diaz is innocent. Mary claims that when she was shown a photo in a lineup that included Diaz, she initially chose no one. However, the detective told her to look at the photographs again. She felt that she was being steered into choosing Diaz. This is the type of sleazebag bullshit that detectives tend to pull when they feel like being lazy and not doing their jobs. She eventually chose him, although she was uncertain if he was the assailant. This is bad in a court of law. One week later, she was equally uncertain when shown Diaz in a police lineup. Once again, she eventually chose Diaz, but she is certain that Diaz was not the man who raped her. Authorities continue to say that Diaz was a bird road rapist and that the verdict was just. Suck my dick, authorities. I would kill you if there were no laws to stop me. Virginia Snyder and Roy Black are convinced, however, that Diaz is innocent and will someday be released. <laughs> no, he won't. He's going to sit in jail for a crime he didn't commit. Luis Diaz continues to maintain his innocence, but he remains in prison. Now, of course, the results of this are unresolved, and, well, Luis Diaz was actually released. Wow. That actually takes away some of my jaded cynicism. Now, after the broadcast, two of the rape convictions were vacated after the two victims recanted their identifications. However, Diaz remained in prison for the other rape convictions. In 2003, however, DNA evidence from one of the victims' rape kit was sent to a lab to be compared to Diaz. The DNA was found to not match Diaz. DNA from another rape kit was found to match DNA from the first rape kit, which also eliminated Diaz as being responsible. But all the other rape kits had been destroyed. As a result of this evidence, in August 3rd, 2005, Diaz was released after serving more than 25 years in prison. He was then reunited with family, who threw a party to celebrate his release. In 2007, he sued the city of Miami for wrongful imprisonment, and in July of 2012, he received $1.3 million. But the real Bird Road rapists have never been brought to justice. But Virginia Snyder noted that she later determined the true identity of the rapists. Her informant, mentioned above, was Luis Nunes, who told her that his three friends, fellow gang members, were the actual rapists. However, Nunez died in 1994 without ever being interviewed by police. The names of the other men were never disclosed publicly, and Virginia herself passed away in 2017. That's actually kind of heartwarming. Not the rape, not the fact that the rapes were never captured, but at least Luis Diaz didn't spend the rest of his life in jail. Foot and mouth, I was wrong on that one. You know you can make bombs from fertilizer? Yeah, it's the ammonium nitrate, super explosive stuff. Anyway, that hopefully doesn't have anything to do with our next entry, which is... Oh. West Fertilizer Company Explosion. On April 17th, 2013, in... Oh, shit. Ammonium nitrate explosion occurred at the West Fertilizer Company storage and distribution facility in West Texas. That's a terrible fucking city name. Who thought of that? I'm gonna go back in time, shit their pants, fuck their wife, or husband, or genderless spouse, and then beat the shit out of them for that name. Now, this is 18 miles north of Waco. Then why is it called West? While emergency services personnel were responding to a fire at the facility, 15 people were killed, more than 160 were injured, and more than 150 buildings were damaged or destroyed. Investigators confirmed that ammonium nitrate was the material that exploded. And on May 11, 2016, the brio of alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosive, also known as the ATF, also known as the Shoot Your Fucking Dog Department, stated that the fire had been deliberately set. I don't know, ATF, maybe you should stay away from Waco. Haven't you done enough in that part of Texas? 
Now, for some background about this, the West Fertilizer Company had supplied chemicals to farmers since it was founded in 1962. As of 2013, it was owned by Idar Grain Incorporated and employed nine workers at the facility. Idar Grain Incorporated is wholly owned by Donald Adar and his wife, Wanda. At the time of the incident, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, is she hurt? had last inspected the plant in 1985. According to records obtained by the Associated Press, OSHA cited the plant for improper storage of anhydrous ammonia and fined it a whopping $30. OSHA could have fined the company as much as $1,000, and OSHA also cited the plant for violations of respiratory protection standards, but didn't impose a fine. OSHA officials said the facility was not on their national emphasis plan for inspections, because, you know, a site handling explosive material is not concern-worthy. And had no record of major accident. And the EPA did not consider it a major risk. Because, you know, a site handling explosive materials is not concern-worthy. After a complaint in 2006 about an ammonia smell coming from the facility, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, I don't, I'm not going to say what the, the shortened version of that, investigated and cited the operator for not having a permit for two storage tanks that contained anhydrous ammonia. A permit was issued once the operators brought the facility into accord with agency regulations and recommendations. Also in 2006, the EPA fined the owners 2300 for problems that included not filing a risk management program plan on time. In June 2012, the U.S. Department of Transportation's Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration further fined the facility $5,200 for violations regarding anhydrous ammonia storage. It's almost like there's a fucking problem with that. According to an open records requested by routers, the plant had a long history of minor thefts, presumably by people wanting to use anhydrous ammonia to make methamphetamine. Because, yeah, you can make meth with shit, too. Isn't that cool? The facility lacked burglar alarms or even a fenced perimeter. It installed a surveillance system in 2009 after law enforcement recommended they do so, though. In an emergency planning report filed with the EPA in 2011, company officials said the anhydrous ammonia storage tanks did not represent a significant fire explosion hazard. I was about to make a joke, but actually, as a matter of fact, indeed, the tanks were still intact following the nearby fire and explosion, so never mind. According to its last filing with the EPA in late 2012, the company stated that it stored around 540,000 pounds, 270 short tons, 240 tons, of ammonium nitrate and 11... 110... Thousand pounds, 55 short tons, 50 tons, of anhydrous ammonia on the site. A week after the explosion, Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitino told inv Senate investigators that the company did not appear to have disclosed its ammonium nitrate stock to her department because, you know, the department of we watch you through your computers needs to know how much explosive stuff you have. Federal law requires that the Department of Homeland Security be notified whether or not or whether anyone has more than one ton of ammonium nitrate on hand, or 400 pounds if the ammonium nitrate is combined with combustible material. The facility caught on fire Wednesday, April 17, 2013, roughly 20 minutes after the fire was lit. Uh, first, It was first reported to emergency dispatchers, and then, you know, it exploded. At 7.50 p.m. CDT, uh, firefighters were attempting to douse the flames. It exploded with the force of 7.5 to 10 tons of TNT. The explosion created a 93-foot wide crater where the site of the fertilizer plant had previously been, but surprisingly only killed 15 people at the cost of numerous injuries. After weeks of investigation, the initial cause of the fire remained unknown. Authorities ruled out whether natural causes, anhydrous ammonia, and ammonium nitrate in a rail car as possible causes. In May 2016, the ATF announced that they would be shooting up Waco again, uh, my bad, that they had been determined that the fire had been deliberately set. However, this finding is widely disputed. No arrests were ever made, no suspects were ever named. Legal and forensic experts have criticized the ATF investigation as they deserve. Fucking dog shooting motherfucker. The massive explosion obliterated the West Fertilizer Company plant and caused heavy damage and further destruction in surrounded areas because, you know, explosion bad. Numbers for dead and injured varied initially. 
In addition to the obliterated plant, the damaged buildings included the Public West Middle School. This marks the only middle school for 50 miles in Texas, and it was not rebuilt for the next eight years. This is a joke, that's a joke. A neighboring 50-unit two-story apartment building was destroyed. Oh no. Now who are those overly religious senators gonna terrorize with bullshit laws? The blast damaged nearby West Rest Haven. Well, who the fuck chose that name? Nursing home and many residents were evacuated. Many of the nursing home residents received cuts from flying glass, but emergency personnel on scene judged that most of these injuries were not life-threatening. On April 20th, some residents who tried to return to their destroyed homes were turned away because, you know, leaking gas tanks and small fires. And according to the company's insurer, United States Fire Insurance of Morristown, New Jersey, the facility was only covered by one million in liability insurance, according to official estimates from both state and company officials. And this amount did not even begin to cover the cost of damages. Furthermore, according to the Dallas Morning News, Texas law allows fertilizer storage facilities to operate without any liability insurance at all. Which is really fucking stupid, considering the stuff can be used to make meth and bombs! Now, West Mayor Tommy Musket told the Waco Tribune Herald that as of late evening, April 17th, six or seven volunteer firefighters from the city were unaccounted for. West EMS Director Dr. George Smith, himself injured, said he believed at least two emergency responders were killed. They did have confirmed fatalities, according to Texas Department of Public Safety spokesman D.L. Wilson at a midnight news conference on April 17th. They also, according to the same dude, had a tremendous amount of injuries, over 100 injuries at this time. Wilson did not confirm or deny an earlier report that the number of deaths could be in the range of 60 to 70. He said the blast zone was just like the Murrah building in Oklahoma City, comparing its effects to the Oklahoma City bombing, and that 50 to 75 homes and businesses were damaged because of fuck you, I guess. Sergeant William Patrick Swanton of the Waco Police Department said that the operation had gone into a search and rescue mode, aiming to find survivors and recover those who might be trapped in buildings. He said at least 160 people had been injured and the firefighters who were combating the initial fire were still unaccounted for. Swanton quoted local environmental officials and emergency personnel in saying there was no risk in the community from the smoke fumes rising from the facility. I can't help but feel like that's a little bit of bullshit. Over a hundred people were injured from the blast, we've already covered this, and were originally transported to a makeshift triage set up at the West High School's football field, because the football field is the biggest part of a Texas high school. It was later moved to a community center due to its proximity to the still-burning facility. Hillcrest Baptist Medical Center in Waco received over 40 injured for treatment. Patients were also admitted to Waco's Providence Healthcare Network. Why are there so many religious hospitals in Texas? Better yet, why is Texas? Stop it, no more. Fort Worth's John Peter Smith Health Network, Dallas Parkland Memorial Hospital, and Temple Scott and White Memorial Hospitals also had people sent to them. Authorities announced on April 19th that 12 bodies had been recovered, 60 people were missing, and that at least 200 had been injured. The 12 dead included the 10 first responders as well as two civilians who were volunteering to nobly fight the fire. The final confirmed death toll was 15 fatalities, and approximately 160 to 200 people were injured. Those living around West report that the blast felt like an earthquake, because this is only, you know, a few tons of TNT. The United States Geological Survey recorded the explosion as a 2.1 magnitude tremor, which is uh, peewee bitch numbers compared to what fracking is going to be doing to the Deep South here in the next few decades. Look at those fucking chumps. President Barack Obama issued his own statement on April 18th uh, about prayers going out to the people of West and uh, that they have the support of the American people. I'm not going to try and do a poor Obama in imitation and make a fool of myself more than I already have by simply having this. Now, of course, let's get into the meat and tendies, the investigation. The state fire marshal department said that investigators interviewed almost 300 people, a quarter of that part of Texas population, and followed 160 leads in their initial investigation. In May 2013, the Texas Department of Public Safety instructed the Texas Rangers, Jesus Christ, 
I'm gonna go on a tangent here. Texas is such a fucking compensation state. If you live in Texas, my editor does, so I hope she doesn't take too much offense to this, but if you live in Texas, and you're one of those weirdly proud of Texas people, stop it. It's a fucking state. It's some goddamn dirt. Knock it off. Alaska's three times the size of you. Stop it. Now, back on track. Where was I? And the McLennan Sheriff's Department to join the Texas Fire Marshal's Office and the U.S. Brio of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, also known as Dog Shooters Incorporated, in the criminal investigation into the explosion. Investigators blamed stocks of, oh, you know, that little explosive stuff known as ammonium nitrate stored in a bin inside a seed and fertilizer building on the property for the explosion, but failed to identify what had started the actual fire that made the explosive stuff do the explosive thing. On April 22, 2014, the U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board released preliminary results of its investigation into the explosion and found that company officials had failed to safely store the chemicals in its stockpile. Oh, you know, that thing that they had been getting fined for for fucking years! And that federal, state, and local regulations about the handling of hazardous materials were inadequate. Oh, you know, that thing they had been getting fined for for fucking years! In a statement released alongside the report, the board's chair, Dr. Rafael Morariso, stated the fire and explosion at West Fertilizer was preventable. Who would have ever fucking thought? It should have never occurred. No fucking shit. And it resulted from the failure of a company to take the necessary steps to avert preventable fire and explosion from the inability of federal, state, and local regulatory agencies to identify a serious hazard and correct it. The report, the board's... I just almost read this same sentence again. The CBS's year-long investigation found that 1,351 facilities across the country store ammonium nitrate, that super explosive stuff that caused this, and that there are many areas had no regulations to keep such facilities away from populated areas. Guess, you know, storing super explosive stuff is definitely safe to have in a neighborhood. More Rasso urged new revised regulations, stating there is no substitute for an efficient regulatory system that ensures all companies are operating to the same high standards. <laughs> Silly you, think of the economy. We cannot depend on voluntary compliance. No, you sure can. The ATF announced on May 11, 2016 that the fire led to the explosion was intentionally said. However, they declined to comment about any possible suspects. The reward of $50,000 for information leading to an arrest had been offered. The finding was subsequently disputed as bullshit. Who noted that the ATF's finding was based primarily on their inability to find any other cause for initial fire. And uh, that's a pretty bad faith argument. Oh well, we can't prove that anything caused it, so uh, clearly someone caused it. Now, of course, one year later, in 2014, the Wall Street Journal reported that fertilizer storage regulations in the U.S. were unchanged, because what did we learn from this? Nothing. In 2015, Texas legislature passed House Bill 942, regulating storage and inspection of ammonium nitrate and granting authority to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and local fire marshals to effect and enforce such regulation. What regulation exactly? I don't know. At least seven lawsuits were filed against a dark rain incorporated, which owned West Fertilizer Company facility. On October 11, 2015, a day before jury selection was to begin, parties reached a partial settlement in one case, its terms not disclosed. This settlement includes the families of three civilians killed in a fire and explosion. This is separate from the $118,300 in fines that West Fertilizer was handed for violating several rules about the handling of, oh, you know, explosive shit. A second trial for a group of plaintiffs was expected to begin in late 2016, and in January 2018, it was reported that the city of West will receive $10.44 million in settlements with defendants in the litigation around the plant explosion. The West City Council approved the settlement, which includes funds for damages not covered by insurance or grants from state or federal agencies. The lawsuit that the settlement pertains to was filed on behalf of the city and claimed the defendants were negligent in selling and distributing ammonium nitrate-based fertilizer and that they had failed to properly warn of the dangers associated with the handling and storage of such project product, which should have never been sold to West Fertilizer to even begin with. There was, of course, a Fallen Heroes Memorial to the 10 
first responders who died, but that doesn't bring people back from the dead, does it? Bowerville Murders, the final entry of this episode, which is good because after a self-destructive workout, I'm about ready to fucking collapse. The Bowerville Murders is a name given to three deaths that were occurred over five months from September 1990 to February 1991 and you're never gonna believe it, Bowerville, New South Wales, Australia. All three victims were Aboriginal. All disappeared after parties in Bowerville's Aboriginal community in an area known as The Mission. A local laborer who is regarded by police as a prime suspect was charged with two of the murders but acquitted following trials in 94 and 06. On the 13th of September 2018, the New South Wales Court of Criminal Appeal decided the man could not be retried for the murders, but let's get into the nitty gritty of it. The first victim, 16-year-old Colleen Walker of Sawtell, New South Wales, was in the rural timber town of Bowerville visiting relatives. She was last seen alive on the 13th of September 1990, walking away from a party in the Aboriginal community of the Mission. The following day, Walker's family reported to the police that she was missing. Despite the family believing something terrible had happened, the missing person's report was not taken seriously by local police because if I haven't hammered the fucking nail into the wall, if I haven't beaten the horse enough, police are kind of inept when it comes to murder. Oh boy. Let's keep going. And of course, no search parties were formed and no formal action was taken because uh, fuck them kids, I guess. Walker's body is yet to be found. I fucking wonder why. Although articles of her clothing were later found weighed down by rocks in the Nambaka River. On the 4th of October 1990, Walker's cousin, four-year-old Evelyn Greenup, disappeared after a party at her grandmother's house. She was last seen by her mother as she was put to bed sometime during the night. But when they woke up the next morning, the little kid was gone. Greenup's grandmother later recalled hearing her cry out in the night, but didn't think much of it at the time. After all, babies cry, and toddlers cry somehow even louder. On the 27th of April, 1991, Greenup's skeletal remains were found in bushland near Congarinini. What the fuck did I just say? Congarinini Road. An autopsy could not conclusively determine the cause of death, but noted that skull injury was consistent with a forceful penetration by a sharp instrument. On the 31st of January 1991, 16-year-old Clinton Speedy Durow went missing after a party at the Mission. He was last known to have stayed with his girlfriend in a yellow Viscount caravan used by the suspect on the morning of the 1st of February. On the 18th of February, Speedy's remains were discovered in Bushland near Congarini Road, about 7 kilometers outside Bowerville. A pillowcase from the caravan was located underneath his clothing. Several similarities between the disappearances led the police to believe they were committed by the same killer. All took place within a short time frame of just five months. All three victims were aboriginal and, uh, you know... Serial killers tend to target people who are unjustly mistreated and victimized by the system. This is why we see so many queer people, this is why we see prostitutes, and this is why we see people of color and Native Americans. Most government systems that stem from Britain, the motherland of daddy issues, tend to sideline these people, to put it very politely. And thus, no one cares when they die, at least not in the police forces, they don't. And autopsies of the two victims that were found indicate both suffered trauma to the head. Lastly, all three victims disappeared after parties in the Aboriginal community in Bowerville in an area known as a mission. Now, just a note to the Wikipedia authors here, you don't need to hammer in that it's in an area known as a mission so many times. Uh, just a little bit of writer's advice here. Don't overuse a specific phrase, or it will weaken your writing, no matter how cool you think it is. But I digress. 
On the 8th of April, 1991, a 25-year-old local Bowerville laborer was arrested for the murder of Speeder Duroux. He was uh, well-known in the Aboriginal community in Bowerville and often attended parties at the mission. On the 16th of October, 1991, while on bail awaiting trial, the man was arrested and charged with the murder of Greenup as well. Facing a circumstantial case, he was acquitted of Speedy Duro's murder by an NSW Supreme Court jury on the 18th of February, 1994, the third anniversary of the discovery of Speedy Duro's body. After the acquittal, prosecutors did not proceed with the trial against him for the murder of Greenup. In 1997, the New South Wales Police Commissioner Peter Ryan set up Task Force Ancud to continue to the investigation into the unsolved murders. On the 9th of February 2004, the NSW coroner John Abernathy reopened the inquests into Greenup's death and the suspected death of Walker. On the 10th of September 2004, he recommended the man be charged afresh with Greenup's murder. As a result, he was charged again, this time only for the murder of Greenup. The trial was conducted in February 2006, and the prosecution produced two supposed confessions made by him, but he was acquitted on the 3rd of March 2006 by the jury. The murders and the fact that no one has ever been convicted of the crimes is a source of pain and bitterness amongst the Aboriginal community in Bowerville. After the acquittal in 2006, the NSW police minister raised the reward to $250,000 for information leading to the conviction of the persons responsible for the murders. The previous reward was only $100,000, and it was only for information related to the disappearance of Walker. In 2006, changes were made to double jeopardy legislation in NSW, opening the way for a retrial of any person acquitted of a life sentence offense if fresh and compelling evidence was uncovered. And in October of 2011, Walker's family found bones in Bushland near Maxville, New South Wales, but forensic testing indicated they were just animal remains. In 2016, the detective inspector leading the investigation made a submission into the NSW Attorney General calling for a retrial based on new evidence. The same month, the suspect said he was not necessarily opposed to a retrial. After all, the jury has gotten this guy off twice. What could they possibly have that would not get them off a third time? In May, there was a protest march by the families of the victims and their supporters calling for legislative change to the NSW Parliament building. On the 9th of February 2017, police laid a murder charge against a suspect, and the NSW Attorney General applied to the Court of Criminal Appeal for a retrial. The Attorney General's application was heard by the Court of Criminal Appeals beginning on the 29th of November 2017. The Attorney General needed to identify fresh and compelling evidence in order to have the man's acquittals quashed and to obtain an order for a retrial. And on the 13th of September 2018, the court dismissed the application, concluding that none of the evidence was fresh and compelling. Surprise, surprise, great job, police department. And that he therefore could not be retried for the murders. The court concluded that the most evidence relied upon was not fresh because it was available to be tendered or brought forward prior to the early trial of the man for the murder of Greenup. On March 22, 2019, the High Court of Australia refused another application by the Attorney General for special leave to appeal against the decision of the Court of Criminals' Appeals, concluding that there was no reason to doubt the correctness of that decision. And the campaign for retrial continues. However, what also continues is the mystery around who killed these people, these kids, and why that piece of shit still gets to breathe precious oxygen and walk upon this earth. Well, there we have it. That's all of Level 9 done. I definitely didn't record an episode for level 10 thinking that I was already done with level 9. No, absolutely not. That didn't happen one bit. If you made it this far, I'd like to take a moment to genuinely thank you. It means the world to me that people watch these videos and that I can make these videos and have an audience, and every day I really do appreciate it. If you're new here, 
go ahead and just hit subscribe. It's completely free, it helps me pursue my dreams, and, best of all, if you fucking hate my guts later, you can always undo it. Now, whether you're new here or not, I hope you have a wonderful time, and until next time, memento mori.